Hi, uh, my name is Siddharth. I am uh, SVS on the internet. Uh, I work for mbibe.com. We are a ed tech company based in Bombay. Uh, can I just say like I know you guys know how you, good you have it here, but you guys have it really, really nice in Bangalore. In Bombay, if you say Redis Miniconf, you are not going to get anybody over there. It's really nice. You are very lucky. Um, so counting things very fast on the internet. Uh, in other words, how to build your own real time stat server. Uh, on the internet is interesting because there's net scale, web scale. So we're talking about doing this uh, for lots and lots of people at the same time. So before we go any further, I'd like just like to like give you my definition of real time stats. Uh, there are a lot of stats that are counted as real time. Uh, web analytics being the most uh, common use case of them, but I'm more interested in going one step beyond, uh, which is uh, where real time stats actually change the user experience. So when you're collecting page views, you're not actually changing the user experience based on the data, at least not in real time. Uh, so if you have a, a blog site like Upworthy, you probably don't need like this version of real time stats. Someone comes and offers you a real time stat solution. Uh, you can write an article about it. Uh, you tell him to go away and you can write an article about it. But uh, if you have multiplayer gaming or adaptive algorithms like uh, today's favorite example quiz up uh, you can learn this one weird trick to improve user engagement uh, the trick is real time stats and the weird bit is doing it in redis uh, redis is a bit weird if you're coming from a traditional uh, sql background uh, it it forces you to think about your data in a in a different way uh, you're no longer going to be able to use the standard relational approaches that you used earlier uh, let me show you our use case for um, for a, for, a, uh, for a real time stat server. Uh, we make a practice application so people, kids can prepare for uh, entrance exams. And as you can see, we support like a number of exams. There are three or four or five subjects in each exam. Each exam has these, uh, each subject has these units. Units have chapters and internally chapters have topics and topics have questions in them. And we want to make the experience as nice for the user as possible. So for example, if a person is having trouble with a particular concept, we want to be able to adapt what he sees next based on his performance in real time. Uh, the other thing is this is a very, very competitive space. Uh, kids are, it's all about being in the top 10 percentile, top 30 percentile, being the topper, etc, etc, etc. So we have a, we have a thesis that we can increase user engagement A by making it more adaptive and B by gamifying it, giving them leaderboards and other things to be desirous about. So uh, why would you use Redis for something like this? Uh, Redis is an in-memory key value store with some very cool features and we'll go through uh, each of them. Why do you want an in-memory store? Uh, frankly, if you want to do it for thousands or millions of people at the same time, you are better off not trashing your disk every time you update a counter. Uh, and RAM is to disk what an F-16 Hornet is to a garden slug is just orders of magnitude faster. And uh, this is a recent statement made by someone more famous than me, but I forgot his name. Uh, memory is the new disk, uh, disk is the new tape, and uh, tape is the new office decoration. So why do we want a key value pair? Why can't we use SQL for this? Any ideas? Why can't we use SQL to run a real-time stat server? Yes, but why not? Yeah, basically, you know, you can't. So for example, we have over 7,000 topics in our database. We can have an arbitrarily large number of people looking at statistics pertaining to those topics. You can have a prof who's got like his report card open for every student with like last six exam stats and or whatever last six day stats and each of them are updating live. You can't run those number of SQL queries in any sort of reasonable useful time frame. And if your recomputation takes longer than your refresh interval, basically you will end up burning your server down. There's not much uh, to do there. Caching won't help you because if you're a really, really busy site, your caches are gonna get busted all the time. So if you want to reliably show fresh data, you're not going to get much value out of caching either. So what we do is we use Redis and we embrace the entire Redis philosophy and we do denormalization. Now, 
I didn't go to computer school, so this may not be the exact correct technical word for it, but I think it gets the point across. You, um, instead of creating a report on, uh, instead of creating the report by saying select star group by and so and so when it's required, you create it when it's written to. So the one thing about real time stats is you don't get so much ad hoc variability anymore. But in return for that, you get these, every time an event happens, you take the delta. So for example, you have a data structure which for this user 252 is made 101 attempts and he makes one more attempt. All you have to do is like increment the counters over there. And now this, uh, this report is reading this report is free and always will be. You can read this for thousands of clients simultaneously all day long and you won't even be using up any CPU or IO. But denormalization sounds weird, right? It's like not normal. I mean, how am I supposed to deal with something that's not normal? And it is a problem. Um, so, so it's a problem, but if you embrace it, you can, you, there are strategies to, to deal with it. Some of the problems you'll find is, uh, keeping data in sync, right? Um, everything is fine and someone goes to Rails console and deletes a, a user attempt. Now the stuff that's cached in your report, or denormalized in your report is out of sync with the actual, if you run an SQL query against it, it won't be right. So how do you keep data in sync? Strategies differ based on what the situation is, but you could say something like don't use Rails console or run health checks every now and then and uh, sync data. Recovering from outages is the same thing. Um, here you want a strong guarantee uh, that every event is processed once and only once. If you have an outage, can you like really just send the last 10 minutes data of, or however long the outage was again and be guaranteed that things don't get counted twice? Uh, and you don't get any ad hoc reporting, which is fine though because normally your real time use case is quite limited subset of, uh, of all your data and you can actually do without, uh, without ad hoc reports. So it's almost like you go down the street, you're thinking about a real-time stat server and the devil comes to you and says, I'll make you a deal. I can give you your real-time stat server, but you're going to have to take the pain of denormalization. So at some point, someone is going to write a database which just does all of this for you. But that point, unfortunately, is still in the future. Luckily for us, though, most stats that you look at, if you like really break down the reporting problem, most stats are either counters or gauges. Uh, anyone here not familiar with these terms? A gauge is this is the value now. So your current memory usage is a gauge. Um, whereas number of page views is a counter. It increments each time. Uh, most of them can be counters or gauges and if you have sets and uh, arrays, you basically covered 99% of the use case of whatever it is you're going to need in your report. So, um, so it's an in-memory database uh, key value store with some really cool features and frankly any amount of time you spend reading the redis docs is time really well spent there are some amazing features hidden in there uh, and um, literally like it's sometimes you meet your soul brother and you say wow you made exactly the database that i that i wanted <laughs> but a lot of the cool stuff is hidden deep inside the inside the documentation so yeah do read the documentation um, if you're building a real time stat server do not leave home without this isolation. You don't want concurrent um, access to the same data leading to um, bad counters. Everyone knows this, right? You want to increment something, you read it from the database, increment it by one, write it back again, but in the meantime, someone else has read the old value, incremented it by one, and so on. So you don't want that. So you want each write to the, uh, to, to the database to be isolated. Redis does great at isolation. You want it to be atomic. Uh, each individual uh, Redis call is atomic. However, if you put a few of them in a Lua script, they are not technically atomic anymore. If one of them is syntactically wrong, uh, the ones before it will run and then it will crash on the wrong one and the rest of them won't get processed. So there is a small like corner case around atomicity in uh, this thing. And yeah, controversial topic pops up. There is no way you're going to run a real-time stat server without your database notifying you when stuff has changed. Um, 
polling this database is no fun at all. It's really expensive and it's the 20, it's 2014. So, we can hopefully have more databases with, uh, with PubSub in the future. Uh, Redis PubSub works fine. I agree it's not durable, but if all you want to do is, hey, this has changed, push this out to over a web socket, it works fine for that use case. So, um, this is what we did. Uh, you have a client which is the, the, the app, the one that the user is facing. Um, he creates, he, he, there's an, uh, there's an event, the event's delta based on its, uh, based on the reports that you want to update is calculated and sent over whatever transport you want, HTTP or AMQP. Someone picks it up off the, off the queue and uh, sends it to Redis. In Redis, we have a lovely little Lua script. Uh, Lua is a very fine language. It's a little weird uh, first time you come to it because they've used all the wrong symbols for everything. But uh, apart from that, it's really nice. And you can maintain a list of uh, watched reports like clients that are actively interested in changes on these reports. And Redis will send a notification every time one of these is updated. Another service listens to these notifications and basically sends this out over Fay or Pusher or whatever your favored um, web socket protocol is. No, Lua is actually like it's a very twisted little thing. It's meant to be embedded inside other programs. Yeah, it runs on, it runs on, it's embedded inside Redis. Yeah, it has access to all of Redis and um, it runs inside that process. So, it gets all the isolation and atomicity that uh, Redis provides. Uh, we'll come to this after the demo. Yay, demo. Okay. Can everyone see this? So, I have used my phenomenal design skills to put together a little demo for you guys. We'll uh, reload this page. So, it's a really simple. Choose one of the two and you get a random number and uh, choose another one of the buttons and it will update the score. Fingers crossed. There you go. So, um, what it's doing is essentially it's saying that SV so it's updated all of these uh, all of these. Uh, sorry, just give me one second. It's updated, so you have one report for the node A, you have one report for the node A1, and you have one report for SVS's relationship with node A1, and uh, uh, with A and with A1. And uh, every time I do this, it goes and updates all these reports. It's doing this in real time and sending me the updated report back. And I can, hopefully, it's performant enough. Uh, there are a few interesting things that are going on here and I'll uh, come to them one by one. Yeah. Well done. How come? How did you? Know? All right. Good. <laughs> All right. So, what it's basically doing is there's a little Sinatra app uh, running behind. It gets the, it gets the uh, whatever post. It says the level is A1, the username is SVS and score is 71. Like basically this is what it gets. And so, I send something to my Redis, uh, to my stat server, which breaks it out like this, that these are the slugs that I'm interested in to update. These are the keys in the key value portion of it. And what I want to do is, I want you to increment attempts by 1. I want you to increment the score by 81. Then I want you to, whatever you get at the end, apply this expression to it. I want something called average, which is I score divided by I attempts. And... Uh, so, I was working on a ranking feature. The ranking feature hasn't really uh, finished yet. So, I won't be showing you the ranking feature. But basically, you just say update this with this. And uh, that's all that you need to say. Once you do that, um, you can get to the, the interesting bit. It's about 83 lines of Lua. Can you guys read that? Uh, yeah, this is Emacs. Let me just sublime text it. Yeah. 
Ya. Sorry. How much time do I have? Okay. So, um, so, uh, the main takeaway is not it's so interesting what the Lua script is doing. The main takeaway is don't be afraid of Lua. Lua can do a lot of phenomenal things. You can make more complex logic, uh, put more complex logic in your Redis database uh, than Redis allows you to do uh, this thing. And the, the, the main reason you use Redis, uh, you use Lua is to say I want all these six things to happen uh, at once. I don't want anyone else coming and messing with the data while any of these things are going on. Yeah, a Lua script will lock, will lock like any other. So, uh, all of them are atomic, like they happen, only that thing is happening in Redis at the same time. Yes, so executing a Lua script is also atomic operation, which means that you have to be very careful that your Lua script does not hang or uh, uh, basically that because then everyone else gets blocked behind it. So, what we do is very simple, we, you remember that I underscore, like we said, to, we convert them into like uh, Redis primitives. Um, so, Lua is very strange, they do not have a string split, you have to implement your own string split when you want to split a string. Um, the other thing, Lua very interesting, uh, so they have this concept of global and local variables, so Lua does not allow you to um, access the global, uh, Redis, so Redis is Lua interpreter does not allow you to access like Redis uh, stuff because he says all bets are off then. Uh, but what you can do is if you want to uh, access things, you can give each function its own like global namespace. And say so for you, your global namespace is this. And so we do that to basically eval, uh, you remember that thing where we said we want accuracy to be attempts divided by correct attempts, uh, that is uh, our average divided by score, score divided by attempts. So, basically any valid Lua that you put into an expression or this thing will be evaluated over here as well. And if anyone wants more detail on this, we can go through it offline. Um, the other thing you can do is leaderboards, right? You get a score, you update, uh, you update, uh, uh, you update the leaderboard and then if the new rank is different from the old rank, you, you send a notification. You publish, uh, what happened here? So, uh, yeah, if the new rank uh, is different from the, this thing, you can just uh, do a pub sub and then your listener can notify people when a leaderboard has changed. And this is really, really cheap to do. Uh, you do not have to keep polling the leaderboard or calculating anything or uh, or any of those. The rest of it is just some uh, bookkeeping stuff that you need to do in order to get this, get this thing working. Um, so, Redis is a really, really, really awesome data store. I think it is just going to get even nicer. I think you are going to see Redis become part of the plumbing of data stores and people will start to build more. Uh, more interesting uh, abstractions on top of Redis, like they're doing with Level DB. Um, so one thing is Redis is fast, which means that your code can be simple. You don't really have to worry too much, and of course your mileage may vary about performance per se, because Redis takes care of all of that for you. Read the manual. I cannot stress this enough. It's one of the most exemplary 
uh, open source documentation you will ever find. Every document, uh, every command even gives you like a shell in which you can type in the command and, uh, and play with it. It's really, really nice. It's very terse and it's extremely accurate. You will not find many mistakes in the Redis, uh, in the Redis manual. And don't fear Lua. Lua is your friend. Lua is a snuggly little programming language that can help you do things that your competition can't. So, um, that's, yeah, there are a number of ways your client will basically do it for you. There are two things you can do. You can say eval and eval SHA. So, eval means you send a script across each time. But what you can do is you can also say eval SHA, which is you send a script and the SHA of it. And then if the SHA doesn't change, you don't need to send the script again. The script is stored in Redis. And uh, it saves you the network overhead of sending the script each time. So, that's basically all you Yes. You just change the script and when the SHA of the script changes, your client will send or Redis will know basically. So, um, the everything else is really simple. The node bits are very simple. This is just something that picks up uh, from a AMQP, AMQP from a rabbit MQQ and calls a particular command on it. And the other one is uh, pusher.js which listens for notifications on uh, something and sends it to pusher. So, what you can do is when a client asks for a particular um, channel, pusher can send that uh, channel state to something listening here and you can say okay, these are the slugs that people are watching right now and we'll just send them out in, to pusher when it uh, when it makes sense. So, uh, that's my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I'm just curious about Go back a few slides. Excuse me how you did some of those things. Okay. Yes. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Website? Web socket. So I'm using pusher in this example. Um, if you look at the source code here. Uh, it use well. It uses pusher. Uh, one second. Uh, The pops up. Call you back, or does it just block it to you? So, if you look at this uh, script, sorry guys. I mean, I know this is a bit small. Uh, if you look at the Lua script, yeah. So when, so for example, when the rank changes, I say Redis dot call publish, and the key, the what is being published is that the channel is rank, and you have a message data, and and at the end of, yeah, sorry, the node client, when it, the Lua script stops executing, it will, it will also uh, tell you which are the nodes that got updated. Okay, now, how does the subscribe end of Redis work? So, as a client app, yes. does Redis block a message, or does Redis call you back? You have to have a separate client for it. But you have a client that essentially blocks until Redis calls back. Yes. Yes. And then it, uh, then it executes the callback function, which basically sends it out over web socket. Until then it's just waiting on the socket yes. for something to come back. Yes. Yes. I think your key space notifications offer you a lot more richness in the, in what it is that you can uh, send on them. I haven't explored uh, BL pop and BL push for this particular implementation because I never had, I started with the most stupid thing like you want pub sub just use pub sub and it it worked fine for me so i didn't really need a reason to uh, to explore those
but yeah I the sidekick uses that. So, surely that is Yes. 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 It's uh, it's it's a tough problem. Keeping data in sync is the problem with denormalization. This is why they tell you don't denormalize. But if you want performance, you're going to have to denormalize. So there are a number of strategies. All of them are painful at one level. Uh, one is that you lock down access to how data is changed to ensure that all of this goes together. This is almost impossible because things can fail at the ready send, etc., etc., etc. A better way would be to have strategies to recover from failure. A know when something has failed. B know how many data points you have. C build the system so that you can offer once and only once processing guarantees. So, in order for me to get back in sync, I should say, okay, I had a 10 minute time uh, downtime on my Redis server from this time to that time. I just go back 15 minutes and just send all the events again, and events that have already been seen before uh, should be ignored. The so now we have like the number of combinations that we can have runs into the millions. So, we can't implement health checks. We can't implement health checks, but if you have a smaller like uh, set of slugs that you are dealing with, you can implement health checks to run every some random specified period of time uh, to to check whether the two data are in sync or not. There are no really really good options. It's also the right one will depend on how many slugs you are looking at. But mostly, um, this is a good solution when you don't care if you are if you drop two out of 20,000. If you are not doing uh, nuclear power plant control systems or flight control systems, it is usually ok to drop a couple and nothing no one no one will die. So, so normally they they do the same thing for web page analytics like they do not really stress if they drop an event or two. Sorry, let me let, let me just do this right. Uh, what the hell happened here? How do we get sublime text to? Uh, not there. Isn't doesn't OSX have the worst like? Uh, ah, here we go. File browser. Success, I think. Yeah, that's the way. Yes. Um, so, the thing is um, redis sets uh, redis hashes are very efficient for storing data, but they do not allow they only allow you scalar values as the as the values. You cannot have a set as a as the value inside a hash. So, this is this this particular thing is so that so I have the slug which has all the data and if it is a set I say slug hash and then the key and I make a set like that. So, this allows me to have sets as to store sets as values as well and then the client basically knows that it has to put all of these together to get the consolidated data back. In Lua, yes. As I said they have the wrong symbol for everything. Uh, this is not equal to right, this is what takes all your time when you are like doing Lua is like why <laughs> can't you just no good I am sure there is a good reason, but. Uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, what you cannot generate a new variable. So that is 
that are common in the same space. So, I mean, is it like a common factor where you can generate key that you can use in the same way? Because what you're saying is whenever you're passing a uh, set of data or what is case or something, so uh, from the specification, is it that there's a, uh, there are there two arrays which you have to pass the values? Yes. Yes. So one is key array and one is value array. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. I don't think that's what he says. I think the first bit he totally says, but I don't think he says that you can't use any other key. Then what I'll have to do is uh, remove the the sets and arrays from uh, from this. Or I mean, it's not difficult to do this outside in Node either. I can definitely. I already know what keys I'm going to need, so I can just generate them in Node and send them across. That's not a problem. This per se is not uh, insolvable insoluble problem. But uh, yeah, seems I've not read the manual as carefully as I <laughs> thought I had. But I mean, I, I remember the section from this. I, I I don't I didn't see this. I mean, I'm not on the mailing list, so maybe I missed that. But it's not an insoluble problem. You can do it outside and then send it to Lua. A small note on performance. Um, this thing does. It takes two milliseconds to update those five keys. And 25 keys takes 3 milliseconds and 250 keys takes 7 milliseconds. So, it's, it's really blazing fast. So, for our, for our app, we update around 55 odd keys depending on who the user is, which you coaching class he's in, etc., etc. And it's like, it's 7, 8 milliseconds. Fast enough. And uh, essentially, you'll only notice the lag over the network the web socket on the way back. No more questions? All right, sure. Yeah, just catch me offline anytime.